an example. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, um, I know that's a long homework, and that as the kind of the second homework, mm -hmm, maybe. Um, okay, would it would it be better if I cut it into like two short homeworks, or not? Or one way. <coughs> hmm? Or one's doing each week. Yeah, instead of having the whole thing wait for two weeks and cut it in half and yeah, I think so. yeah. would be better. Yeah. Okay. It's harder to manage a big chunk of time. Yeah. Yeah. So okay then um contently speaking, how is the homework? How do we feel? Is it okay? Too hard? Easy? Who dared to say that? <laughs> was that okay? It was good. It was manageable. The other class was horrible. <laughs> it's too hard. It's too hard. I mean, I thought some of the programming was... The programming is non-trivial. It was very buggy at first. So that's, that took a little while, but I mean, it was okay. Yeah. It just it was more tedious than anything. The coding, uh, like debugging, uh, yeah, interpolation just yeah, takes forever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this minus this, and this times this, and this times this. You but mean it's not like hard? It just takes a while. Okay. Yeah. What you want to say? I didn't understand the proof for the error bound. Yeah. Oh, that's a tricky one. I know which one you're asking. That's tricky. Oh, the yeah, the uh, Taylor expansion. The Taylor option. expansion one. Yeah, I don't know. Ta Taylor expansion, the local truncation yeah. error. Yeah, yeah. That's chapter yeah. one. Okay. okay. Are we talking about the Taylor expansion or the one where it's down? The inter by interpolation. CPU? Yeah. I'm talking about four A. Okay. <laughs> so, sometime during the weekend, maybe tomorrow morning or sometime, I'll put the answer on Angel. It will be a very detailed answer with words and just detailed, all right? So read it. And also, um, in the other class, a student complained about the, um, the last problem, the Newton's divided difference. The coding was non-trivial. Maybe I could have been more instructive. I think maybe the lab session, like just fix it on Friday, doesn't really work because I don't know on Friday you're ready to deal with this or not. And or or we wait a week and on the Friday to pick up that thing, which is too late for turning in the homework, right? So um, you will have my codes in the answer for that homework. Okay, so if you had trouble writing that piece of code, and then you might want to look at my code and see how I did it, and try to understand why I did this and why I did that, and any question, come and ask me, okay? Okay, so, yeah, okay. All right, so um, now, next Monday, we have a computer lab. Mm -hmm. I want to catch your attention. The room is 214, that's not the room we were. Right? Don't go downstairs. It's second floor, I think. So give yourself a couple of minutes to find that computer room. I'll do that also. And then we'll meet there. So we'll finish, kind of a, kind of a finish today on cubic spline, at least the derivation of the algorithm. And it will be on the homework, number three. The homework number three is a much shorter homework. But there is a programming part on cubic spline. So it's perfect timing that we finish it today, and, uh, and then you get help on that on Monday, okay? So to make the lab session more efficient, I will ask you to do the following. The homework three is already on Angel. Take a look at it, make an attempt, try to see what you have to do, kind of a prepare yourself, so what questions you will have. And then on Monday, I will tell you a few hints of what to do and hopefully during the lab session you can finish the programming part for homework three. Is that okay? Sounds like a plan. So don't come in and try to, oh, where's homework three, oh, what do I have to do? And then you sit there 15 minutes, you're reading it, you don't get help. Okay? So prepare yourself, all right? Okay, that's that. So let's go into cubic spline. Okay, 
so it's a kind of a heavy class and heavy in the sense that I have to write a lot my arms already sore okay we will try to derive an algorithm that will compute the natural cubic spline mm -hmm. so last time we set up so let's kind of put the beginning part so we call these zi's equal to second derivative of um, actually it's just s at ti right so we say we started from the second derivative and uh, we try to go back we integrate once and twice and go back okay so these are the zi's the second derivative and because it's natural so we have those two additional conditions z1 and zn right okay and I also have the notation hi will be the interval length between two um, neighboring knots okay and then we wrote out the Lagrange form for the s double prime which we did last time so let's write it again so we'll be focusing on the interval from ti to ti plus one so we're writing everything on that interval okay i is a generic index okay so let me write it in this way so z i plus one over um h i x minus t i minus z i h i x minus t i plus one so that's the lagrange form so what we're going to do today will be i'll integrate it twice integrate twice okay so which means i can integrate once to get s prime and then you integrate again you will get s is that right so the goal is to reach this SI. So you know each time you integrate, you obtain an integration constant. So you do twice, you have two integration constants. These are arbitrary constants, right? They're arbitrary in value, and also there is some, how do you say, a little bit kind of arbitrary the way you write it, as long as you have two constants. Okay. So so I will, I will say that there will be two um, arbitrary constants okay and I will write them in the following way so this is one of the little trick I say there will be various tricks along the way so this is one of them this special way of writing those integration constants okay so s i prime you will be integrating this once I will write it in the following way so c i plus one over two h i x minus t i square minus z i two h i x minus t i plus one square and I know I need some constants, right? So instead of writing one constant, I write it as this. A ci, a constant, minus di, that's another constant. So adding them together, it's still a constant, okay? So that's one. And then I'm going to write si in this form. Integrate this one more time, I get the following. z i plus 1 over 6hi x minus ti 3 minus ci 6 hi x minus ti plus 1 cube plus ci x minus ti minus di x minus t okay oh gosh so long Okay, so you would say, you, would, you might ask, well, why do you write them like this? Well, you know, you have two arbitrary constants. How many constants do I have? I have two arbitrary constants, right? And you can go and verify that. If I differentiate this expression here, do I get the derivative? Meaning, is this an antiderivative of that function? 
do we see that it does the job? If you differentiate this, what do you get? Three times this square, right? Three with six cancels, you get two exactly. Do we see? And you differentiate that, three cancel six, you get two, and the power reduces to two, right? And you differentiate this one, you get ci, and you differentiate this one, you get negative di. So this is an antiderivative. Do we see? And how about this expression? If I differentiate this once, do I get the s double prime there? Do you see? You differentiate this, you get two, times x minus ti. Two cancels the two, you just get this thing, x minus ti. Is that right? And you differentiate that, and you exactly get this one. And those two constants you, you differentiate, they're gone. Do we see? So you can verify, verify the, the differentiation relation or the antiderivative relation. So you, you take your SI, you differentiate, and you verify that's okay. And you take your SI prime and you differentiate it once and you verify that's okay. Okay? So that's the correct antiderivative twice. Okay? So the advantages of writing it in this form will come very soon. So, okay, so, so far what do we know? We know that the second derivative is continuous, right? Zi's, and Zi they are actually unknown at the time being, but we just call them Zi's. But to qualify as a cubic spline, there are many, many other um, properties it must satisfy. So let's go through some of these properties. So important, first important is that it has to interpolate, right? Interpolating properties. So on this interval from ti to ti plus one, I have this function si, it must interpolate at the two end, right? So if you look at si, evaluated at ti, this must equal to yi, agree? Mm -hmm. And then second, if I look at the the right end of this interval, ti plus 1, and this must interpolate the data, which is yi plus 1. Is that right? So those two must be satisfied. Okay, so let's check. So the first one, okay. So I'm going to use this expression here, and I will put in x equals to ti. Is that clear? So now you see, if I put in x equals to ti, what happened to the first term? Is zero. And what happened to that term? Is zero. Agree? So, and this shall equal to yi. So I have yi equals to, the first term is zero. What about the second term? If x equals to ti, what is ti minus ti plus one? Negative hi, is that right? Can I put that in right away? Are we okay? Zi over six hi, and then I get a negative hi to the cube. Is it okay? Okay, and then if it equals to ti, that's zero, so nothing to do. And then if it equals to ti, and this is again a negative hi, is that right? Okay, so that gives me um, plus actually di hi. Okay, are we okay? So we see that um, um, this actually cancels one power of it and I get a square. Mm -hmm. And then in this whole expression, let's write it one more time to be cleaner. So yi equals to negative zi hi square plus di hi. Okay, I just rewrite it so it's cleaner. So you see, if the zi's are given, then I can use that to compute the di because yi hi, they are data. I know them, right? Question? Are you missing a six? Yeah, there is a six. Okay, I lost a six. <laughs> yeah? Uh, this might be a dumb question, but what if you cubed it first, then wouldn't the negative signs cancel out? 
for the Asian. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I lost. There's no, no you, it's not a dumb question. <laughs> now it's correct, right? So can we um, solve this for the I and write the I in terms of the others? Mm -hmm. So I could divide both sides by HI, right? So I get YI over HI minus, and then I move this term over. This gives me ZI um, I get HI over 6. Okay. That's that, and then let's do the second interpolating property. So if I put in ti plus 1 for each x, I should get yi plus 1. So we see that this term will be 0, and that term will be 0. So from the experience we had, we already know in the end, I would just get ci in the expression, right? OK, so this gives me zi plus 1 over um, so this will give me h cubed, right? So let's put it to be h i square. I cancel on an h i, and that's zero. And this will be c i times h i. Is that OK? And then I do the same thing, and I write it c i in terms of the others. <coughs> y i plus 1 over h i minus z i plus 1 h i over 6. Yeah, we OK? So what have we achieved? We find the expression for c i and d i, right? So in terms of z, so z we don't know yet. So, but at least I can say now, if I know z, if the zi's are found, which we will find, then I can plug that in and I can find all the ci's and all the di's. Is that right? Then they can be computed. And once I have the ci and di's, I can plug them in. I can find s i and s prime i. Do we see? OK. And this will allow me to compute the si of x and the s prime i of x. OK, so let me be painful and write it out. So I will write out now si of x. Mm -hmm. I'll be just copying that thing and plugging the ci and di with these expressions. OK? So it's zi plus 1 over 6hi x minus ti cube minus, OK, zi 6hi x minus ti plus 1. That's the first two terms. And then I put in the ci, which is That's my c, which is multiplied with uh, x minus ti. Mm -hmm. Let me come over. Then now I put in my d, which is yi over hi minus zi hi over 6 x minus ti plus 1. So if the zi's are found, then you know your spline. Agree? That's the expression. Each SI is now given. Okay? And also the derivative is given. So let's write this out. So this actually I have to write out. Now, this it's useful to write it out because <coughs> you have to code this. Okay? No, you don't have to. I didn't tell you. Um, the code for natural cubic spline will be provided to you for the next homework. 
for your job will be understanding the derivation today and knowing what has to go into the code. And then you read this piece of code and understand what it's doing so you know how to use it. All right? It's a bit easier. Okay. All right, but okay, this piece you will see it will be coded, okay, in the program that will give it, that will be given to you. Okay, so then I have some. now this as prime is actually important. I have to write it out. Minus the i over two h i of x minus t yeah plus so what would I be adding here will be uh, a CI minus a DI right what's here is the CI minus DI so what I will be doing will be um I will join the terms with Y together and join the terms with Z together is that okay I'll be writing this minus that okay so Y I plus 1 minus Y I over H i minus Z i plus one minus Z i over six H i. Now, is that okay? So that's the way I wrote it. Okay, and uh, this term here, why I join them together? Well, that's actually my data. Do you realize? Once your T i's and your Y i's are given, the H i's are given. It's just ti plus 1 minus ti. And then this expression is given, right? So that's kind of a, the data. So instead of keep writing this term over and over, I'm going to call this guy a shorthand. This is my bi. Is that OK? So later on, I just write bi to be a bit easier. OK. So now we say if the zi's are given, I can write s and s prime like this. So keep, keep your heads cool and review it. What have I done? What information, what conditions I have already used? And uh, is there something that I haven't used yet? So for a cubic spline, the definition says it has to satisfy a bunch of conditions, right? First of all, it has to interpolate the data, which is guaranteed. We check. So the function is continuous, right? And also there are continuities of the derivatives. Are they satisfied? Have we checked all of them? Mm -hmm. No. So if the check that z is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So if the check that the z's are equal to zero. These one? Yeah. No, these are given. They are set to be zero. Okay. That's a boundary condition. Yeah. So for cubic spline, k equals to 3, right? 3 minus 1 is 2, which means first derivative had to be continuous, second derivative had to be continuous of your spline function. Is that right? So do we need to worry about the second derivative? Would it always be continuous? Yes, because we started with a linear spline for that. So what's missing? Which one I haven't checked? the first derivative. So we must, um, so the last condition that we haven't used is continuity of S prime, right? At the knots. Okay, so this means I need to verify the following at the knot Ti. Mm -hmm. So from the left, that's the derivative of the spline from the left at ti must equal to the derivative of the spline from the right. Is that right? And this holds i from z no zero. The inner knots one, two, to n minus one. Exactly. We haven't checked that, right? We haven't imposed that condition. Okay, let's see. What does that give me if I do so? So Oh, that's the good chalk. Okay, so I'll use the space right next to it. Okay, so you see um, the connection, hot, hot connection. 
All right, so I think that shall be good space. Okay, so let's write out S i prime at t i. What does that equal to? Because I have to set that equal to the other one. So S prime is given here. I'm going to put in x equals to t i, and I see that guy is zero. It's so convenient, you see? Our brilliant idea of writing it into x minus ti's, right? That's 0, and I only have this term. If it's ti, ti minus ti plus 1, that's hi, right? Squared, OK? And then these are the fixed stuff. OK, so I would have first is 0. The second, I will have, um, if this is hi, then it cancels 1. So I get a negative hi over 2 c i. Is that right? Okay, that's all I have got from that. Mm -hmm. Plus, okay, those two terms. So, so let me write the b i, so it's quick, and then minus um, z i plus 1 minus z i over 6 times h i. Is that okay? So that's that. And then I need to also figure out um, um, the, the thing on the left. So I need a step. So let's write out this guy here. So it's this function when I um, reduce the index by 1, right? Because I need index i minus 1. So let's take a step. So write this out with the index and it's become 1 less. So this will be zi over. 2h i minus 1 times x minus t i minus 1 square and then just reduce all the index by 1 plus this will be b i minus 1 minus z i z i minus 1 over 6 h i minus 1. Is that right? That's the derivative as a function. So let's now put in, um, put in um, x equals to t i. Okay, so when x equals to t i, and I see that this guy is 0, t i minus t i. So that term is gone. Only have that term, t i minus t i minus 1. What is that? h i minus 1, right? one index less. So cancels one of this, I get a z i over 2 h i minus 1. Is that right? Okay, and then with the others. So b i minus 1 minus um, z i minus z i minus 1 over 6 h i minus 1. Okay, now it's a bit tedious. Now we need to set them to be equal to each other. Okay, so now I do the following. I do um, s i minus 1 prime t i minus s i prime t i equals to 0. Is that okay? I take this and subtract that and set it to be 0. Okay, so which I'll do here. All right. Okay, so um, I have zi. Let's see, zi is my unknown. Okay, let, let's do that first. Over two. Mm -hmm. Okay, the bi's, I'll, I'll take care of them later. Okay, so minus zi minus zi minus 1 over 6 times h i minus 1. So I took care of this term and that term, right? And then subtract the other. Negative, negative is positive. So I get h i z i over 2. Mm -hmm. I'll take care of b i later and then I get plus z i plus 1 minus z i over 6 h i. Okay, since the bi's are my data, they don't involve any of my unknowns, I'll move them to the right-hand side. Is that okay? 
If I move that to the right hand side, if you move this to the right hand side, it's negative. This is negative because it's minus. Move to the right hand side, it's positive. So bi minus bi minus 1. Is that okay? Okay, it's annoying to have that fraction expression. How about I multiply the whole thing by 6 so I get rid of the fraction? Can we do that? Let's do that. So I'm going to mess it up. So I'm going to multiply by 6, which means this 2 is not there, actually. I have a 3. And then I want to get rid of this 6. Okay, so I get that. And then the 2 is not there. I get a 3. I get rid of the 6. I have a bracket. And then this whole thing is multiplied by a 6. I'm sorry, we are squeezing in. Okay, and let's collect like terms. So, on the left hand side, so, okay, keep our heads cool. What's my unknown? What am I trying to solve here? I'm trying to solve for HIs or ZIs? ZIs are my unknown, right? So I want to write them in terms of the unknown ZI, okay? The like terms, so how many different ZIs there are on the, on the left hand side? I have ZI minus one, and I have zi appear a couple times, and I have a zi plus one. Is that right? I'm going to collect these like terms, okay? So for zi minus one, what do I have? What's the coefficient in front of it? Did I mess up with the sign? I think so. Did I? Oh, no, I didn't. So zi minus 1, negative, negative, positive, times h i minus 1. That's the coefficient in front of it. Is that right? Okay, what about zi? So for zi, how many terms do I have? I have 3 times hi minus 1, minus 1 times hi minus 1, which gives me 2 times hi minus 1. Okay? Keep that in your head. And look at here. I have 3 hi minus an hi, which gives me 2 hi. Right? So the 2 is a common factor. And then I have hi minus 1 plus hi. Is that okay? And then for zi plus 1, I have only one term. What is its coefficient? Is hi. Okay, and the right-hand side is 6 times bi minus bi minus 1. And the index i runs from 1, 2, 3, all the way to n minus 1. So, in principle, you have n minus 1 equations, linear equations, right? So, what do you do in MATLAB? You make this into a matrix times a vector, isn't it? Can we do this? So, matrix vector form. Okay, so this takes some time to write out. So let's write this big matrix. We need a big matrix here and give more space. I never have enough space for this matrix. And my unknown and my right hand side. My right hand side is easy. So my unknown I know are the z's, so it'll be z1, z2, z3, all the way to, um, let's write one, z um, n minus 2 and z n minus 1. That's your last one. Okay, and then I put the right hand side in, so it's 6 of, when, z, when it's z1, um, what do I get is um, b1 minus b0, 6 b2 minus b1, 6 b3 minus b2. This is the easy one, and all the way down to 6 b um, n minus 1 minus b um, n minus 2. Okay? Okay, so what about this coefficient matrix? We'll try to fill in here. OK, 
Okay, let's look at the first equation that I will fill in here. So for the first equation, i equals to 1. This will be z0, right? So what is z0? z0 is 0. That's my boundary condition. So this term is not there. So the first equation actually contains only z1 and z2, right? So which will give me two coefficients, the first column and the second column. Is that clear? So what's for the first column is 2 times h0 plus h1. That will be the first column, and the second column will be h1. And it's all 0 afterwards. Is that clear? So what about i equals to 2? What do we have? z1, z2, z3. Is that right? Which will give me a number in the first and the second and the third column. Is that right? So what's in front of z1 is h1. What's in front of z2 is 2 times h1 plus h2. In front of z3 is h2. And it's all 0 everywhere, outside. Is that clear? Let's do one more. When i equals to 3, then I get z2, z3, and z4, right? So the second, and the third, and the fourth column. Is that clear? So the, actually, the first one is 0. So whatever is 0, I don't write. I, I only fill in the non-zero elements, OK? So then the first one will be h2. And then what in front of here will be 2, h2 plus h3. And then in front of that one will be h. 3. So now you see, for each equation, there are only three unknowns, right, appearing. So they're always together. If you keep doing it, you will see this group of three numbers will just move down along the diagonal in the matrix. Do we see that? OK, so this goes down, and this goes down. So let me write out the second last one. And then I'll write out the last one, so kind of a conclude. So the second last one would be um, h n minus 3. And then the diagonal is 2 h n minus 3 plus h n minus 2. And then this was h n minus 2. And then the last equation, you would have um, when i equals to n minus 1, this becomes z n. And you know, putting the boundary condition zn is 0. So this term is not there. You actually get only two unknowns. So you have two places with non-zero. So that will give me hn minus 2 and 2 times hn minus 2, hn minus 1. OK? So the diagonal, the upper diagonal, and the lower diagonal are the only three kind of lines of non-zero element in this matrix. <coughs> okay, so what do we call such a matrix? Anybody knows that terminology? If your matrix has non-zero only along the diagonal, what do we call it? Diagonal matrix. Diagonal matrix. Now you have three of such lines. What do you think we call it? Tri-diagonal Yes. <laughs> OK, so I will write it as h times z equals to my right-hand side, b. So is it clear what they're referring to? h is that matrix, z is my unknown, and b is that right-hand side vector, all right? Something special about this h matrix, that's all most important, because we want to solve that. OK, so we notice that it's a tri diagonal matrix. But it has more. I know we haven't talked about numerical linear algebra. It's kind of a motivating you. Everything we run into, have we noticed? We always end up solving ax equal to b. Right? That's so important. In the end, we'll deal with it. We'll learn how to do that. Okay. So this is tridiagonal. OK, so but it has other properties. Um, OK, you have to believe me that it's desirable to have a symmetric matrix. 
because it has many other nice properties and we have well-developed theorems to deal with symmetric matrix. So we know what is a symmetric matrix as definition. Is this matrix symmetric? If you transpose it, you flip this one up, is it the same? It is, right? So it's symmetric. So anybody knows some nice property for a symmetric matrix? Say with respect to eigenvalues? If a matrix is symmetric, what happened to the eigenvalues? Guaranteed, they will be? Oh, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, and they'll be real, right? Nobody has taken 436, 441? No. Okay, then you just have to trust me, I can tell you anything. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a symmetric matrix, the nice property is that all the eigenvalues are real. All right, they can be zero, but they will be real. So what, what's so nice about it that if you use it, combine it in the inner product, that operator is called self-adjoint, but okay, we don't have to know that. But it has something else. Maybe you have heard. Look at the diagonal elements. Compare the diagonal elements to the elements that's non-diagonal, comparing to their size. You know these H's are all positive. Do you see something? Those that I underline, that's the diagonal line. Do you see those numbers are big? It's like the boss sitting there. Mm -hmm. If you add up all the non-diagonal elements, this guy still is bigger. So what do you call that? Yes. So why is it so nice to be diagonal dominant? <laughs> if it's diagonal dominant, what does it mean? Okay. I know, I know, it's, this is not a course of, uh, of matrix or linear algebra, but okay. I just want to convince you that linear algebra is so important. It's everywhere. Whatever you run into, you, you write it into AX equal to B, you have to deal with these things. Okay. So if it is diagonal dominant, then we know the matrix is non-singular, meaning the determinant is not zero, meaning it's invertible, meaning there's unique solution. Okay. So this will give me a unique solution unique solution for the z vector. Okay. And not only that, if it's diagonal dominant, it means that you can perform this thing called Gaussian elimination. Are we familiar with Gaussian elimination? How do you solve a 3 by 3 system equation? You perform this Gaussian elimination, make it zero, and then you do backward substitution. Have we done that? If it's diagonal dominant, then the Gaussian elimination will always work. You never run into trouble. Okay? So this works without any anything. Okay. We'll get into details on this when we talk about numerical linear algebra, which is a big topic. Okay. So this piece of code on solving this as a tridiagonal matrix using Gaussian elimination will be provided to you in the code for cubic spline. All you need to do is read it and understand that part does it, okay? So I'm not asking you to code that. So, okay, now let's summarize. Looking back into all that we have derived, what will be our algorithm? So how would you compute and find the cubic spline? What would you do first? The previous discussion says, if the z's are given, I can find my spline, which is over there, si's are given, right? And then we figure out a way to compute the z, right? So we're deriving it in the backward order. When you're actually computing it, you will have to compute this piece first to find the z. Is that clear? So your code will be given ti given yi. I will set up, I will compute all the bi's, I'll set the right hand side vector, I'll set up this matrix, and I'll solve it. Is that clear? So that's your step. So step one, set it up, set up this hz equals to b, and solve 
for z. Is that right? And once you have all the z's, well, then you can plug it back in, in here, and that's your spline, and you have it. Okay? So, step two, and then compute the spline. With the z's that you have just found. Okay? Can we visualize a program like that being carried out? There's one little piece which I like to talk a little bit about before I let you go today. So, let's say that's our T0, this is my Tn, and then you have these knots, T1, T2, T3, da da da, let's say this is Ti, and this is Ti plus 1. Ti plus 2 dot dot dot. Okay? And you know, the spline that you find out, all these Si's, let's say on this interval, you would use the expression S2. Is that right? It's piecewise defined, isn't it? Each cubic polynomial is defined for the interval, right? So on this interval from Ti to Ti plus 1, you will put in the expression Si. Right? Okay, let's say, let's say this will be the expression as i plus 1, and this will be, let's say, s0, and this is s1. They're piecewise defined. Okay, so you computed all the z, and you know for each si you can compute. So here comes the question. I give you an x. I want to find the value, the spline value f. S of X. So here the question, how do you know which SI to use? Mm -hmm. Question, how to find basically the index I such that TI, your X lies on that interval. You have to write that little piece of code, or you have to identify that little piece of code in the cubic spline code which I gave to you, because you will need this for the linear spline, which you have to code, which is much easier. So how would you do it? Can we design some pseudocodes? Do we need for loop, if test, while loop, or whatever? What would you do? Mm -hmm. You will have to have some kind of a, you can do a for loop or while loop, right? You have to go through all the t's. Let's say, let's say my x is here for some index i. Mm -hmm. So you check if x is bigger than t1, okay, keep going. And then x is bigger than t2, keep going. Bigger than t3, keep going. At certain i, x is bigger than it, I keep going. And then at ti plus 1, oops, I find x is less than that. That means I just crossed my x, is it? Then you stop and keep that precious i that you have there and subtract it by 1. And that's the interval where x is on. Is that clear? Can you write a little short code like that? Is it clear? This piece you have to code for your linear supply. All right? Okay, we'll talk more details on Monday during the lab session. <coughs>